Hello, friend, and welcome to Strange New Broadcast 1.3 with Peter and Amory. Hello. Uh, we have a little bit of previously on. And we've heard from Thomas McCamberley. I just thought I'd remind you that there's a fourth classic sci-fi film reference with the, uh, the day the Earth stood still in the first episode, too. Yes, because we noticed Children of the Comet was a comet, even. Uh, was making, what was the references in Children of the Comet? Uh, Alien was one. Yes, with the design work. There was a few. Yeah. No, there's an extra one. So what happens in the day the Earth stood still? Uh, that's the one that he's actually watching. I mean, it's a blatant reference. Oh, OK. Fair but enough. also it mirrors the plot then with the first contact that they make. Ah, OK. And Thomas continues, As for Spock's laughter, I paid it no mind personally. I look at the strange new world Spock as little baby Spock. <laughs> he's not original Spock yet. It's also a kind of like Spock's Rumspringer, which is an Amish rite of passage, where he finds out exactly what is Spock and what isn't. Pike had given him advice on when to laugh, and in a moment of tension and success he gives in. I suspect he decided it wasn't for him. Yeah, it's the problem is it robs later events, uh, stroke earlier events, obviously, in terms of when they were filmed, of their impact. So it undermines them, which annoys me. But there we go. Because, you know, basically you, you should be on a trajectory that gets eventually to Spock in Star Trek, end of Star Trek 4, Star Trek 5, where he's chilled and at, at peace with himself, certainly by Star Trek 6. Whereas if he started perfectly chilled but made some sort of choice, it, don't, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Spock is the unsolvable problem with this series because you, you know so much about him that it's very difficult really to explore any new territory with him and i suppose we're supposed to think of him as the damaged spock from discovery still in recovery from all of that well, that seems like a long time ago now though doesn't it uh, yeah. but in his lifetime it isn't though hence yeah. the reference in the lift in the but as i say that, then that that cuts out some of the impact later on when he develops more human or is it more comfortable with his human characteristics if he starts doing it now it doesn't have the impact later on but anyway we've also heard from boss I've heard the parallel universe Amory likes yellow and thinks that purple is a hideous colour. <laughs> Quite possibly. Anyway, <laughs> that was Children of the Comet. We move on to Ghosts of Illyria, which is written by a, a Kayla Cooper. First of two, written by them. Also co-executive producer. Also wrote episodes, four episodes of Luke Cage. And The Nun 2, Electric Boogaloo. Hmm. Mm. Also written by Bill Wokoff, who's one of the producers on Strange New Worlds, and wrote three episodes of Star Wars Rebels. Oh. Directed by Leslie Hope, who played Kira's mum, Deep Space Nine's wrong was darker than Death or Night. Do you remember her? Uh, not what she looked like, uh -huh. the character, yes. Yeah. Uh, also directed three episodes of the new Lost in Space series. Okay. And here we've got Enterprise doing a horror movie, and we get to play some Trek Bingo. Do we? Okay. Oh, yes. Quite a bit of it. <laughs> if you say so. Mm. First officer's log. Stardate 1224.3. The Enterprise has arrived at Hedimut 9, the site of an abandoned Illyrian colony. Illyrians are a humanoid species known for modifying their genes to enhance their capabilities and levels of function. However, because genetic modification is forbidden in the Federation, they have always been outcasts. Our presence here is part of a standing mission to discover what happened to them. Unfortunately, research time on the surface is limited as the planet is regularly swept by ion storms, one of which is fast approaching. So they're visiting an Illyrian colony and the Illyrians had genetic modifications and everything genetic modification-y was banned because of now they, but they placed the eugenic walls later we grew up with them being in the 90s didn't mm. we with Carl Noonien singing in the 90s and now they're placing them a bit later yeah but... and Illyrians were mentioned in Enterprise or uh, and appeared in Enterprise but in that they had four head ridges oh. so uh, Una's had some plastic surgery I think okay well, she does say at the end that she comes from a different colony and that they the reason they have the mods is to adapt themselves oh, to yeah, the Oh, yeah, I suppose. So okay, so it could be different. Um, I mean, she could have had plastic surgery, but Illyrians. she could be she could look different. Mm. This planet that they're on is being swept by ionic storms and the, the team is down there gathering data in leather jackets, because why? Uh, sort of away jackets. I don't know why they're leather particularly, but... Oh, right. like the sparkly ones they had in the original series with the useful belts. Yes, be better than the sparkly ones. And and interestingly, I think there's a bit of a touch of the 
Star Trek the motion picture away jackets about them. Uh, those are a bit chunkier, but they're certainly the same colour. So I quite like that sort of vague continuity there. Okay. Uh, this is filmed at the amazing looking Ontario Place. You can probably guess where that is. Yeah. Which is a genius bit of location work. If you Google Ontario Place, you'll realise just how much they used. But then, you know, put all the storm and stuff onto it and the flames and bits and pieces to make it look like an alien world. But it's quite impressive. Mm. Apparently, so Canadians watching, oh, it's just Ontario Place. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like they filmed in London. We go, yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. Millennium Bridge. Oh, like when you watch Thor, yeah, which yeah. is the one it is, and yeah. you know you don't go on the tube that way. <laughs> um, no, no. Uh, it, I think it's Thor Ragnarok where a bit of one of the ships is quite blatantly the Millennium Bridge. But yes. anyway. <laughs> But you talking about Ontario has now earwormed me. I'm not going to try and sing the song because I'm not even sure I remember the tune, but I'm hoping we have a Canadian listener who might be able to help. Because I learned this song when I was a girl guide, so I would have been 10, 11, and the song contained the lyrics, G-mar, I want to go back to Ontario, G-mar, I want to go home. If you know what on earth that is and why I've been earwormed with it, do let me know. Why did I sing it as a girl guide in London? I don't know. <laughs> that I won't find out for Google, I guarantee. <laughs> it's on Wikipedia. It's about it's an army song. It's a traditional humorous song satirizing life in the armed forces. And I was singing that as a girl guide. Why? Yeah, I don't know. I mean it's a uniformed organization, but that's going a bit far, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, here's, here's why. A song occurred in several variations. The lyrics been adapted for the different branches of the armed forces and it's been transformed into a camp song as well. Camp which songs. Which is why you were singing it. it. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I think it was probably I don't want no more of girl guide life. Yes. <laughs> that would make more sense than army life. Yeah, it? but I think that's what it was. I think they changed army life to girl guide life. Uh-huh. Sorry about that um, rabbit mm. hole. But just you mentioned Ontario. And immediately yeah. I went, gee, ma, I want to go back to Ontario. Yeah, anyway, sorry. I've totally lost the plot now. Uh, so there's a storm coming in and the transporter's being messed with, which is Trek Bingo number one. Yeah, oh, Problems right. the transporters. <laughs> yeah, with an ionic storm. And you've got an ensign and he's looking in a cupboard. Yes, Ensign Lance. Yes. And then they talk about how they've got emergency backups for the power transporter, that which they need to reroute. And they said, you know, prepare the bridge for, for going to backup. And you the people walking down the corridor and there's like a just a momentary blink where clearly they're transferring the power. And then they can now get a lock and beam them up. And Hamer gets called a genius. But Spock and Pike are still on the surface because Spock has been engrossed in some logs. <laughs> He's wandered away. <sighs> And he's uh, he's looking forward to taking a cache of these journals because the this this particular group of um, Illyrians wanted to join the Federation and were trying to de-engineer themselves in order that they would be accepted. But it's too late for them to actually beam up because there's just too much interference. So they have to run and find shelter, and that's your teaser. They're running for the storm to try and find shelter from it, which is less than five minutes. That's a short teaser for yeah. <laughs> Stranger Worlds. So Una comes onto the bridge and she explains that Pike and Spock are stuck there. She wants Uhura to tell her the moment contact is resumed. And she said, you know, we, we, we have to do our jobs. And then she says, you know, get Kyle to organise relief because you've got to have the transporter on standby the whole time. And then Ensign Lance is in his vest and pants. Clearly he forgot his PE kit. Mm-hmm. And um, he's trying to get to the light. I've seen the light. He injures himself trying to do so, so or Ortega sort of calls security and drags him and it, it, um, then you see Una in her quarters and she's also drawn to the light, but then she sort of glows, rips her uniform for no adequately explained reason. And then her whole body sort of flashes, I suppose, and then she's okay. So uh, I'm not counting this as Trek Bingo because this is specifically an original series thing, but rip shirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. So having had that strange experience, she then contacts Dr. Mbega and says, how are the landing party doing? And he's like, yeah, you know, I was going to call you. We've got a bit of an issue here. They've all got peculiar symptoms. It turns out they're all attracted to the light. So Trek Bingo number two, space plague. Uh (laughs) And they're all, he can tell that they've all got a severe drop in vitamin D. Why don't they just take tablets? That's what you do. (laughs) Anyway, 
So they've been in contact with something that isn't being filtered by the transport because the biofilters should have detected it or filtered it out because if they don't recognise something, they will filter it out. They manage, Uhura manages to establish contact with Pike and Spock, but only briefly, so it's just enough for Una to say, yeah, we've got a plague up here, it's a problem, oh shit, bye. Do you mean that's kind of it? So that's obviously um, Pike ends up rather anxious and pacing because he knows his crew are struggling and he's not with them. And then you have Una in her courses looking stuff up about the Illurians. But this is what I don't get because La'an comes in and she's like, you know, what you're looking at and why. And she could just go, well, there's a problem. People have been on this colony, so I'm looking up this people to find out answers. Why does she have to be so... She's kind of shifty about it, isn't she? And and then they mm. end, it end up with a discussion then of you know well they might they might have something to help us and they're not federation's not right about everything. But she's on the back foot from the get go when she could have just said we need answers to what's going on. I'm trying to find them. Mm. So I found that a little bit odd. But Arne is very very anti GM anything, and then she starts to show symptoms, and it turns out that this is contagious. So they initiate a full lockdown to prevent the spread. Oh, goody, a lockdown. <laughs> wonder what was on the writer's minds. Yeah. <laughs> Great escapism, this. And then back on the planet, Spock says, a watched kettle never boils. Pike's like, it's a pot. And then he's just like, yeah, don't mix your metaphors just to try and cover up your anxiety. And they're talking about the, this group having de-engineered themselves to try and fit in with the, the, the Federation. And they both see sort of ghosts in the cloud. And it's like, did you just see what I just see? What? Yes, but I don't know what it was I saw exactly. In the meantime, Ahura gets woken up and she finds she's like got the screen down from her door. Yeah, uh, notice this is kind of lower deck style. Yeah. They're all sharing quarters here. I mean, yeah. all right, lower decks share a corridor, but, you yeah. know, this, they've got almost the sort of same design of bunk with that thing that goes across. Well, that's across. what they have in the Navy. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, um, I, I like the fact that that's, you know, it's, it's not as quite as primitive as a Cali class, but it's not far off. Uh, yeah. She's fine, but her roommates again forgot their PE kit and they sort of gather around trying to find the light. But she's fine. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. Meanwhile, um, Hamer wants to look at the medical transporter and Venga does not want him to. Mm. And he sneakily presses a switch behind him to sort of say, you know, turn all the lights off and then go, now look what you did. Meanwhile, on the planet, there's a noise that alerts Spock and Pike to the fact that something is trying to get through the door. And it's like, Okay, so we heard rumours of creatures living inside the storms. I think we can confirm those rumours. Meanwhile, back on the ship, Uhura confirms that she needs pitch black in order to sleep. And it turns out that the contagion is being carried on light waves, which they all agree is sort of a very clever way for a virus to transmit itself. So the answer is going to be, well, let's turn off all the lights. But it's not going to be easy, given that everybody who's infected is effectively a light addict. So yeah, they're going to have to sedate all of them. Meanwhile, you've got Una again looking up more of the genetic modifications of the Illyrians. And she keeps saying override, 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 and it keeps letting her. Yeah. Obviously, she's got quite high security clearance, otherwise that's really pointless. Yeah. I find that... But she's not having to give a code or something. She just says... Yeah, presumably it's voice okay. recognition. So the the, the, the blackout has, has, has happened, but then it, it's being overridden in the transporter room. Okay, so she hurries to the transport room and finds Hamer is transporting up a piece of the planet's mantle. Oh, mad. Absolutely fucking mad. And Una has to stun him. We get a slow-mo hero shot of her carrying him down the corridor for some reason. Quite know the point of that, unless they were running slow, you know, behind time, wasn't The ghosties break through into the room that Pike and Spock are holed up in, but then the storm passes by and they go, seemingly having prevented being the two crewmen being sucked out of a smashed open window. So they're good ghosties, apparently. Yeah, Casper. Yes. Una fesses up to Mbenga that she's immune to the plague as her genetically modified system overcame it. Transpires she's Illyrian. How did Starfleet Medical not know that? She must have had tests at some point, surely, before when, when applying and stuff. They must have found out. The doc points out the system doesn't have the antibodies they need as it burns out new infections immediately. He also highlights the fact that Starfleet have found a new prejudice in its rejection of GM peoples. Yeah, because it shouldn't be that you reject GM peoples. Hmm. Reject the technology. Yeah. Uh, and even then, though, in all circumstances, would you, if you see what I mean? Because she makes that point, doesn't uh, she? Yeah, I think it's the consequences of meddling with that yeah. sort of thing is the, is the issue they have. But, you know, that doesn't mean you reject the people. But anyway, yeah. the computer informs them the warp core containment field has been deactivated and Laan is missing from sickbay. 
This leads to a cool fight in engineering, with Laan calling her friend an abomination, which is nice. Spock supposes the ghosties are the colonists, who were planning on renouncing their GM nature, but it all went Pete Tong, and they were literally dying to join Starfleet, as it turns out. <sighs> Thank you. Trek bingo number three. There's a oh, chunk of medical techno babble in sickbay as Chapel explains, inverted commas, how getting irradiated by the warp core cured Una and Laan. Yeah, right. I don't miss that trope, it has to be said. <laughs> Hand wave him. Una joins La'an in the rec room, and the first officer points out that whilst Earth's augments are dangerous, Ilerians are peaceful scientists, and they make up with strawberries, as you do. Then she fesses up to Pike and resigns. Needless to say, he doesn't let her. This is pretty much a cliche, isn't it? Yeah. Throwing your badge on the table and the, your superior it's officer not letting you... It's yeah. the equivalent of a cop movie badge and gun, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, basically, yeah. He points out she's a good example of, to Starfleet of a GM person. They've discovered Mbenga's medical transporter doesn't have the latest biofilters, and it's his turn to make a confession. He wouldn't let folk touch his transporter since he has his dying daughter in the buffer, a la Scottian relics. He hopes to find a cure for her. She promises a dedicated power source for it from the warp core. Una is in her quarters, and uh, Star Trek bingo number four, a personal and confessional log entry is recorded, then deleted. It's just like you could just hear Cisco's voice in that, really, couldn't yeah. you? <laughs> I can live with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So come on. <laughs> and we finish on Mbenga reading a fairy tale to his daughter, which is obviously very sweet. So we have much more screen time for Una in this, which is good. Yeah. And they're making good use of the fact we know so little about her background. Mm. So, you know, sort of contrast that with Spock. Pike and Spock are sidelined in a way you've never seen in the original series. Yeah. But they still get time together, though. Yeah. But they're not the focus of the plot. No. Which is nice. Ultimately, though... It's kind of Trek by numbers plot-wise, but you don't care as the characters are so well-written, I think. And I think in, in this one as well, it, it it's still got the sort of Trek I, I like, which is that they they start off with thinking that the life forms in the storm are going to eat them, mm. and actually they turn out to be good. Yep, yeah, and, that's true. And that's the sort of thing I like. It's mm-hmm. At the moment, with the world we're living in, we need some optimism, optim, optimism that word. Optimism prime, yes. Yes, <laughs> and, <laughs> and some positivity. And, yeah. I, you know, I, that's one of the reasons, that's an aspect of the plot that I like. I have a feeling that if this series had come out just after Next Generation or Deep Space Nine, I'd be yelling derivative, as I did with Voyager and Enterprise. But now, well, let's face it, it's a pleasant change to have the old favourites in a story that wraps up, for the most part, in 45 minutes. So, yeah. I mean, obviously there is a bit of a, a juicy dangler at the end, but, uh, yeah, it's it's a self-contained story and they don't need to follow up on that. I think if I'd seen this after we'd watched Voyager and everything, I probably would have had criticisms because I think, to be honest, I was a bit trekked out at that stage. Well, no, but, I mean, my, my the reason I was trekked out with Voyager was it was just reheating old Next Generation plots. Whereas I just wanted to kill more of the crew than I wanted to keep alive and, and see come home. Yeah, well... So, it, for me, it was characters. I hated yeah. Neelix. I fucking hated fucking Chakotay. <laughs> well, the Ent- in Enterprise, the characters weren't too bad. I mean, I, some of them weren't very fleshed out. But... No, but no. I, but then I but liked the problem Enterprise again with, more than you. Yeah, but again, the, my problem with Enterprise was rehashing old Trek plots. Which, arguably, they're doing in Stranger Worlds, but it's been so long since we've seen these, and they're doing it with... As I say, with these characters that you've immediately grown to love, you know, this is three episodes in, and it's like, yay, we like these people. I think the other thing is that unlike where Enterprise went wrong is when it buggered things up, like having forehead Klingons. Yeah, yeah, that didn't help. Whereas other than the issues with Spock, which may or may not be resolved, given that we've got another season of this to go at least, because it's started filming if it hasn't finished. Issues with Spock aside, they're not buggering up the continuity. No. They're doing separate and different and new mm. things. Um, so with Voyager, my issue was the characters um, more than anything else. And with Enterprise, certainly in the first season, I felt they did too many things wrong. But mostly I like later seasons. Well, let's find out what other people thought. We've heard from Doreen, who writes transporter problems, at least one character claiming to be a genius. Oh, that's true. That's another thing on Trek Bingo. Mm. Hamer claims to be a genius. And a mysterious illness after, vi- after visiting an isolated Chapel planet. Chapel does as well, come to think of it, doesn't she? She does, yeah. yes. Woohoo! We're in for another classic storyline. 
Number one being a Bandelirian genetically engineered being is fast become a cliche in Star Trek 2, but it's a nice backstory secret and issue for number one's character for the rest of the series. Oh, that's right. The Doc did the wrong thing for the right reasons, so his secret is also going to be kept and protected too. Sorry, that sounds more cynical and critical than I meant. <laughs> yeah, so he his error wasn't deliberate. He didn't knowingly endanger people by stopping them doing anything with a medical transporter. that's He didn't deliberately endanger lives. He hadn't realised. And that's why he then also goes to tender his resignation. And I like the fact that Una, having had such kind treatment by Pike when she tenders hers for her secret, immediately learns from his example and she does the same for Mbenga. And mm-hmm. she doesn't shop him. She's kind to him. She's like, no, we're finding a solution to this. It shows that Pike's model of leadership is working. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Doreen. Thanks, Doreen. And we've heard from all. Hello, Peter and Amory. It's all here, and I'm going to talk to you about the Strange New Worlds episode, Ghosts of Illyria, which this is the second time I've watched it, and it didn't really grab me first time. And I'll be honest, it didn't really grab me this time either. We have this sort of quite standard, there's a disease on the ship, and it's spreading from people to people. And the doctor has to try and fix it, and yeah, that seems fairly, you know, it. We, we've seen it before, never quite like this, but we have seen it before. And then we have Spock and Pike stuck on a planet where there's storms that can't be transported out. You know, it's sort of that plot device that you can't use the transporter thing that we get from time to time. And then there's, you know, they're in danger because of glowy alien things. Again, all feels a bit standard issue Star Trek I'll be honest where I think this show is best when it's doing those things but in a little bit more of a subtle way what we do get is plenty of character development we learn lots about Lan and um, number one and yeah that's all fine I think it is interesting to take a look at the Federation's real problem with with genetic modification that I mean I I'm not quite sure how this works because it's clearly stated here that the the thing about genetic modification is a federation thing. But why is it not just a human thing? You know, what, what, do the Vulcans have a problem with eugenics or with genetic modification? And if so, why? Because they don't share our history and there's no reason why they would assume that that genetic modification would be a bad thing. In fact, I can see the the Vulcans being quite logical about it and going, well, if I can genetically modify myself to be smarter and more logical, then I'll do that. That's great. They probably wouldn't say great, though, would they? But anyway, so so why has this, you know, quite quite vehement phobia that the uh, that the humans have spilled over into the Federation? Is it Homo sapiens only club? Um, yeah, an interesting thought there that I don't believe is ever resolved. Talking about things that are never really resolved, the the sort of the the light filia um, infection on the Enterprise is solved when the warp core does a radiation and number one absorbs it and then everyone gets better. Possibly I wasn't paying enough attention, but I missed what the hell happened there. And maybe, you know, by listening to you guys, I will have had an explanation because I don't get it at all. The other thing, I mean, on a second watch, it is a bit more obvious that this episode is setting things up for later in the in the season. But it did kind of feel like that first time round as well, that we've got Dr. Mbenga's daughter, we've got um, number one being an Illyrian and being a GM product all of her own. It's, yeah... It's putting putting things in place that we can come back to in the future, even if they're not necessarily dealt with uh, very clearly in this episode. Um, so, yeah, despite my um, my general love of Strange New Worlds, and to be honest, it was still a perfectly entertaining hour of telly, uh, not one of my favourites of the season. Thank you very much for the podcast, and I will endeavour to remember to record another bit of feedback in a fortnight's time. Probably, maybe. If you're lucky, no promises. Bye bye. Bye. In terms of what happens, an explanation is given, <laughs> but the moment you examine it, 
it's problematic. So the explanation given is that bearing in mind that um, because she's modified, Una's system automatically responds to, isolates and deals with anything, any kind of infection, any kind of threat to the body. And she was touching Laan when the radiation hit, which meant that Laan was exposed to the antibodies. That antibodies. Yeah, but that, antibodies don't work like that, do they? Through skin? She'd have had to have been sort of sharing blood or something, I, I think. That bit I don't know. What then happens is that resulted in what's called chimeric antibodies in Laan. A chimera is just another word for a hybrid. So created hybrid antibodies in Laan. And unlike Una's antibodies, which evaporate as soon as the infection has gone, because Laan is human, her antibodies were still there, and therefore Mbenga was able to use those to create an antidote. What doesn't work is the the antibodies that Una created were in response to radiation, not in response to the light filia. So what Mbenga has actually created is an anti is an antidote to radiation. Yeah, that too. Or an antidote to ap- absolutely fucking everything, but definitely not an antidote to the virus, as far as I can make out. Mm. So there's there's a partial explanation there, and it might not make much sense, but it does tie into what he says earlier on in the episode, where he says, no, if I'd been there right at the time and synthesised them immediately, I might have been able to get something, but no, it's too long, your antibodies have all left your system. They still have left Una's system, but the exposure to those antibodies created chimeric antibodies in the arm. So some of that works, the... They're still saying, no, Una hasn't got the antibodies. Potentially that's why she can bypass the medical screening. It's because there isn't anything unusual about her blood until and unless it gets attacked by something. Surely her biology must be very different and therefore that would be picked up on. Honestly, I don't know. But then, as I said, I, I don't personally understand how, even if you accept that Laan was exposed to Una's antibodies... I don't understand how that very specifically creates an antidote to this particular light filia rather than either specifically an antidote to radiation exposure or an antidote to absolutely fucking everything, which then means nobody gets ill from anything at all ever because they've now got magic vaccine. It was a poo solution, it has to be said. It really didn't stand up. No, it didn't. As I said, it sort of sounded good, but the moment you think about it, it doesn't really work. Uh, It didn't work the first time for me, so anyway... And I guess that whole thing about, you know, how much the Federation is just humans. Um, yeah. <laughs> that is a, and that's consistent with the rest of Trek, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, to be fair. But it is an issue. It's like, yeah, the humans have a problem with GM people, so therefore the whole of the Federation does. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Unless, from the point of view of the Vulcans, they're looking at the humans and going... Okay, so far, we haven't encountered other races that tried this. You're the only race that tried it, and look at the mess it made of you. And so, but then, surely, you would think that having read the logs that... Bearing in mind what we know about Deep Space Nine I'm coming to here, which is in the future of Trek, you would think that having read the logs that Spock finds that Starfleet would understand that not everybody who is engineered is a badden and that therefore they wouldn't be coming down as hard on Bashir as they do in Deep Space Nine. Mm. Because they should have that information now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it isn't going to get resolved quickly, is it? So, yeah. Una's in trouble, really. <laughs> yeah. What did Sampo and Yonna make of this? Hello. Hello. So we just watched Ghosts of Illyria. Yes. What happened in it? Well, d- disease. They went to lockdown. Uh, I don't know if oh. there was the lo- word lockdown ever used in relation to diseases before 2020. Can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. Well, never mind. Well, you wondered a bit what, what's so bad about genetic manipulation. Yeah, I, I didn't quite catch what was so bad with Illyrians. Yeah, well, I explained that about all about the eugenic wars in the 90s. Yes, thank you for explaining. Well, thank God they, the wars ended when they sent all the genetic supermen into space back in the 90s, never to be seen again. Hmm. Yeah. So, so the 
woman who has some kind of genetic manipulation Illyrian genes in her body. Mm. <laughs> she kind of said that they didn't shape planets. Mm, yeah, but just last week they did. But uh, they kind of did. Yeah, but that, I mean, she wasn't. I mean, when she said we don't change planets, she, I think, oh no, she was talking about the Illyrians, not the yeah, Federation. I One might argue that uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. that I mean that actually modifying yourself to suit the planet instead of modifying the planet is actually a much better way. But mm. from my point of view, I mean it's actually pretty interesting to see how sort of fanatic the Federation is about gene manipulation. Even though I saw it, I don't. It's it's not very often seen like well, this. Most if, humans are fanatic about that too. Well, this is supposed to be a sort of near perfect utopia, but of course, never really is. I don't think it's really perfect. No, this was a very serious episode. Yes, it was. I did. I mean, we both like the one Spock quote: "I'm armed with knowledge." Yes, that was like it, it's the best quote ever. I also like Spock quote. I also like the where when Una was. I can't remember the en- blind engineer's name, but when no, it wasn't Una. Someone asked, "How did you do that?" and he just answered, "I'm a genius." <laughs> so but it was nice. I'll have to use that. Hamish. Yeah, I guess it was. I'll need to use that in my job sometimes. That and <laughs> that and I'm armed with knowledge. Both good quotes. Yeah, you have to do that. <laughs> and then another thing that I wondered: she was finding information from Illyrian, and there were like secret information in the computer, and she was just saying override. Uh, well, what's the point of having secret information if you can just say override and then you get the information? Um, I guess because she's the sort of second highest ranking person on the ship, so I guess the captain and some hmm. others have the right to see the restricted files, but not everyone it, could do that. Is it like voice command or is it just a word? I mean, she was on her. I I don't know. Okay. Well, one thing I don't. Know, I mean, the story of. Uh, the doctor storing her child in the transporter buffer. I mean, that's quite touching, but I don't re- realize why did it have to be a secret? I mean, that would sound like something that the Federation would be totally on board. Like, sure, let's store her until we can cure her. I mean... Uh, were were hmm. they just trying to get other female uh, watchers to cry? Because I didn't <laughs> cry. I don't know. <laughs> And of course, in the uh, beginning, when the one guy was sort of... The first guy was attracted to the light. There was the, the I can't remember her name, but she was like, "Okay, whatever floats your boat," which is un, yeah. un, until he started smashing through the glass. That was yeah. uh, well, that boat didn't float anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, I quite like this. A bit predictable, but I enjoyed it. Yes, and it was thoughtful, mm. well, well made, and yeah, and beautiful. Well, I have to say, this is very beautiful. This, mm, yeah. Uh, And Serious. yeah, and when the sort of plasma beings appeared, I mean, you asked like, aren't Star Trek aliens usually humans with just bumps on their foreheads? Yeah, I asked that, and yeah. I thought they weren't like uh, typical. Well, that's 50 years of uh, special effects improvements of oh, 60 years. Huh? Yeah, those creatures were beautiful too, but uh, yeah. I, I think the filming is nicely done. Yeah, it's a and pretty... And uh, scene where um, this Illyrian woman and the another... Was she also Illyrian? No, she was human. Okay, something happened and they just fought. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I looked at the set mm. more than yeah. the characters. Yeah, Sorry. it's pretty the engine room. But okay, well, let's stop it there. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It does look beautiful. Mm, yeah. It's, it's very well. I mean, you have to sort of really stretch your imagination that this is the same Enterprise we saw in the 1960s. Obviously, you can sort of claim, oh, well, that the bits of the engine room we saw there were just like you know tiny off bits of the main bit. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it it does. It looks lovely and sleek and you're right it's good that they've got more than just forehead aliens mm. yes uh, we have moved on from the bumpy foreheads look in star trek and think that's a, yeah. can only be a good thing because that was getting very tired by voyager wasn't it yeah to be honest it was getting a bit tired in deep space nine after yeah. a while they seem to have run out of ideas towards the end of that to be honest yeah and um, speaking of deep space nine yeah the, the um gm stuff is still yeah a big issue in that so yeah But I do. I think you're right that the idea that you terraform yourself to fit the planet and the planet to fit you is a good idea. If you yeah, I mean, I think 
generally, isn't it? Starfleet's issue, Federation's issue with GM is that it tends to breed people who think they're superior because, yeah. well, genetically they are. Well, that's um, like, it's like having an aristocracy in this, it, this country and Jake yeah, but Smog. but an aristocracy that isn't based just on chance birth, but actually on specific things that have been changed in the human being that technically make them superior that's the problem yeah. um so yeah you, you do have an issue there uh, i love the fact that yona needs explanation <laughs> to understand these episodes it, it's pro- possibly not the best series to come to you know as your first trek series it has to be said but, but then she, she's enjoying it yeah, right? yeah, yeah. it looks beautiful but yeah some things do need explaining mm. um i haven't watched any of the cartoony one which Prometheus, presumably... not Prometheus, something like that. A pro, pro... But I don't know whether that's more user friendly to a newbie. Prodigy. That. Um... I, one would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Presumably we can get that on Paramount Plus. I, I assume it's there, yeah. So hopefully it's there. Hmm. I would just be interested in giving it a look and then seeing what I think of it. Mm-hmm. it Who could... knows? Maybe that might be a, a future series we cover. It might be, or it might not. I might hate it. I don't know. <laughs> you, you'll seem to be echoing. Oh bit predictable but it didn't stop you enjoying it Mm -hmm. right from the other side of the world we've heard from llama gods llama gods luck scotty fix the yard noi fix it four shut that not count five is right out now in full disclosure here i'm actually on holiday in singapore at the moment and knowing this i recorded some feedback for this week's episode well in advance and picked episode four by mistake um yeah wild on me anyway i have Made use of the time differences here, yes, very spacey, wasty, timey, wimey, to rewatch the episode in time. And yes, yeah, so we have some quick feedback for episode three. Actually, episode three, I think it's the one with the ghost and the Illyrians, yeah, right, yeah, got that, good, good, good. So, yeah, this is a classic Trek episode premise, isn't it? And again, this is one of the episodes when I read the pre just before the series ended. Sorry, before the series ended, and yeah, yeah, this is why I was going to be into this, because this is a classic Trek idea. Everyone on the ship is struck down by a virus, yes, brilliant, love it. This is pure Trek, this is what we do. And, but yeah, it's a nice twist on the virus idea as well. It's a virus that travels by light. It's great, science fiction concept, love it. And although you get this as a sort of typical bottle episode, everyone's trapped on the ship, unable to escape in some sort of lockdown. Yeah, lockdown, they actually mentioned lockdown this episode, and no one protests on the ship. Weird that, this really is an ideal future, isn't it? Despite all that, they actually use it to also look into character, and that's what drives most of the story, because the actual real story behind it is a very, another very Star Trek episode, uh, Star Trek idea, not just the science fiction virus idea, but also the idea of acceptance, because they're investigating the Illyrians, and it's a race that's been denied entry to the Federation because they are genetically modified, and yeah, we know this from Trek history of the future and the past, that there's the genetics wars, and we know why the Federation is against genetic manipulation, but... But there's a lot of bigotry here as well. And again, we see this in the future, sort of, past, kind of, when it comes to Dr. Bashir, and we find out that he's genetically modified, and we see that again here as well, and how the Federation's bigotry stops some good people from coming and actually joining. The fact that there was this whole colony joining the Federation, or wanted to join the Federation, and in order to do so, they had to undo what had been done to them, basically changing who they were because they couldn't be accepted for who they were. That's a very powerful message, and... The whole idea behind Star Trek is that it's about a thing of acceptance of who you are and what you can contribute as an individual. So, yeah, the fact they explore this in this episode is very, very powerful. And what's more interesting is that we don't, at the start of the episode, you think it's going to be about La'an, but it's not. It's about Una, who has a secret history, and, yeah, she's an Illyrian. So this is interesting as well. We get to flesh out her character, and, yeah, she makes some sacrifices. But what's great to see is that the crew stand up behind her. There's no bigotry there. They're very accepting, and, again, they prove that they... Once again, the crew of the Enterprise is upholding the very ideals of the Federation. So, again, this is just Star Trek, isn't it? This is just what Star Trek should be, and this is who the crew of the Enterprise should be. And it's great. I love it. We also, very importantly, get to learn about Mabenga's backstory here. He's hiding his daughter in the pattern buff, which is a tragic story, but, again, with a nice little science fiction twist, and we've seen something similar, or we'll see something similar when Scotty does it in the future, past kind of thing. Anyway, and that adds an extra dimension to his character. And, finally, we learn that, basically... Most of the people on the ship are damaged in some way, and they're all slightly weird in their own way. So, yeah, that's what really does make this a proper Enterprise crew. Although they're not like, although they're not quite as creepy and perverted as the crew of the Next Generation Enterprise D. So, yeah, they're a better Enterprise crew. So, yeah, that's what's really loving about this series because the crew is just all coming together. So, yeah, no, this is great. So, basically, that's a very long-winded way of me saying that this is great. Yeah, I love it. This is proper Trek. It's dealing with issues. It's doing science fiction thing. Doing great character work. Once again, this is a great Trek. The only question I really have at the end of this episode is, 
when are those jackets going to become available? I really want one of those away jackets because they look great, but yeah, the official stores don't have those yet. So yeah, those are some rushed last minute thoughts. When I get back to the correct side of the planet, although for certain values of correct, I look forward to finding out what other people made of this. I hope everybody has had a couple of weeks or so, I guess. And until next time, glory to you and your cast. Thank you. Live from a Singaporean cave. <laughs> <laughs> or was it a basement? I don't know. <laughs> well, they've locked him up. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it was a bottle episode, pretty much, apart from... Well, except the... for the the location filming, so yeah. that kind of cuts that out. But yeah, it doesn't use any guest actors beyond that one ensign. So, but yeah, I wouldn't quite well, class it as a bottle episode. in the Hura's... Yeah, that's true as well. But yeah, so I wouldn't quite class it, cause, I mean, and actually that location filming is really adds a lot to it. I think it does. It, yeah, it, I think that's what sort of stops it feeling like a slightly cheap episode. Um, but yeah. In terms of no protests against lockdown, well, they're military, aren't they? Yeah. They're used to following orders. And then we know there are plenty of folk in the Federation who are aren't happy with Starfleet and go their own way and stuff. So they're probably, yeah, there would have been people who would objected, but no, but not yeah, Star, honest, not Starfleet honest. officers wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. Do it's same. gold. Yeah. And also, I mean, there's a limit to how much you can lock down on a ship because it's things like you stay in your own work area, but you still got to work. If you see what I mean, you can't completely isolate, hence it spreads, which is what they found on um, submarines and warships with COVID. Mm. Um, you can restrict interaction and move. I mean, it, to let's say it's, it's a bit easier on the Enterprise where there are, you know, replicators in every room or yeah. pattern. What do they call them? Something. I don't know. Virtual replicators. Yeah, I suppose they couldn't just put everybody in the transporter and send them back out again and hope it would work. Because that will what they do in next gen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that all easy solution. At least they didn't fall back on that. But then again, at least that made more sense than what you we did, got in this one. Did that actually make more sense than, yeah. 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 But yeah, I like the fact that we're struggling with their tenses with Trek these days. Yes. Because you know, they would do insist on setting series is in the past but yeah. never mind never mind i like the character of pike i really do and i'm really enjoying learning more about uhura and una as well because she's just one episode wonder isn't she in mm. the original series and yeah most people are weird in their own way more so on this ship than the d this is kind of like a crew of barclays <laughs> not quite, not quite as bad as that, but they, they all have their own issues and hang up in the way that the next. Well, I don't know. Riker was a sleazeball. Geordie was even worse. <laughs> yeah, but they were all pals. Yeah. Whereas, whilst this lot aren't hate, everybody hating everybody, like at the beginning of Discovery, there also there are tensions. It was interesting. We had some tensions between Una and Hamer in this. Yeah. Um, and there are obviously the tensions with Laan and, and Una as well as a result of what emerges in the episode. Mm. So, yeah, good stuff. What did Parry think? Hello, Args. Harry here to talk about Children of Elyra. Um, this one, I suppose the, the ongoing thread through this one, aside from our effectively one and done story, is we find out, and on this idea of character building again, two of the characters are harboring secrets. Um, one of them is number one, or Una, who is harboring the fact that she is actually an augment. And a nice idea that, uh, yes, not all augments were bad. And in fact, an interesting discussion that Starfleet's complete ban on all genetic modification might not actually be that good an idea. Um, that might have its downsides because they're fear from the eugenics wars. Uh, we also do find, yes, Laan is related to Kan Nuni and Singh. It's not just a, a kind of a related one, but uh, she's not some form of augment um, family name, I'm guessing. So, uh, yeah, and that does kind of leave... I mean, I think probably my only criticism on that part was the tension between her and Una is um, is kind of over by the end of the episode. They kind of have their disagreement, but then patch things up by the end, and it would have maybe been nice to have that uh, stewing for a few episodes. Um, like I say, as a result from this, at least by all appearances, it's fixed. Um, the other one is, of course, Mbinga, who's got his daughter hidden in the transporter buffer because she's got a terminal illness. And it's, I mean, again, the episode does kind of the same trick twice in another way. Um, the way Pike says to Una when she comes in and says, I'm resigning my commission because you could be in trouble for having me and I lied to get in. And he says, I don't care. Uh, but it's almost with the, you're not, the Pike one's a bit less of the, you're not sure if he's saying yes or no. Whereas with Una, you know, when uh, Mbanga basically puts himself in her mercy and um, she says no, and he looks initially absolutely crushed. There's some great acting there. 
Uh, but then she says, no, it's getting an individual power source. We're going to make sure this doesn't happen again, but I'm not going to basically sacrifice your daughter, which was, again, a nice touch. Um, always seems a bit cruel when you think of it, actually, that she did just say, you know, no, I'm absolutely going to keep your daughter alive. Do not worry about that, for starters. Now, here's what we're going to do. Um, would maybe be the better way of saying it. The actual main plot of the episode, you've got two two sets of peril going on. One is um, on the planet, uh, Pike and Spock are stuck, and they're really just, it's to keep them out of the frame, I think. They're stuck on a planet with some weird creatures, ghosts, in an ion storm. Um, and that was just the interest, you know, again, nothing particularly fancy. The concept on the ship, the uh, virus that um, transmits through light, is again, it's, that's your classic Trek stuff. You know, we've got a virus. How does it transmit? We don't know. And the, they're working out the problem and trying to find a cure. Even if it's a MacGuffin at the end, I don't really care too much that it's a kind of MacGuffin. You know, I did, and I did like everyone kind of um, doing their, you know, everyone kind of occasionally going nuts with the light, I particularly Hemmer beaming up into the crust, the, the mantle into the transporter room. Um, you know, I thought all those things were quite neat. And again, it wasn't like an amok, not an amok time, a naked time or whatever it was. Um, uh, uh, you know, one, um, that naked time rather. Um, it's not like that sort of thing where the crew are acting out. It's just they're they're working off a virus. But they did really almost manage to find everyone a little bit to do in this. It's kind of actually a bit weird in that I don't think any character didn't have a line in their appearance, probably something someone will keep an eye on. But yeah, overall, good, solid, enjoyable stuff. And again, I like this. We're building up some character development while at the same time um, having these one-and-done stories. Um, it's really good. So uh, yeah, all that remains for me to say is do keep up the good work. I will look forward to the podcast, and I'll feedback in the next one. But until then, bye for now. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I was getting Naked Time, Naked Now vibes from it to begin with. But it, it didn't go down there, oh, we're only a few episodes in, let's show the crew in acting like weird people. It was like, actually, no, they're just acting the way they are because, you know, they've got this addiction to light suddenly. So, um, yeah, it wasn't quite as crazy as that, thankfully. <laughs> it was fun, though, especially Hamer and the, I'm going to transport some other planet's mantle. I mean, that was yeah. just fucking punk. <laughs> yeah, he I goes all it. out, doesn't he? Yeah, I love it. And yes, I know that Una is mirroring what uh, the captain did with her when she said, oh, you know, of course we're going to sit my resignation, whatever, and it's like, and she said something like, can I just be on my record that I really wanted to join Starfleet? And he says, no. And then there's a beat, and then he says, because you're not resigning. Mm. And I know she's doing it because of that, but she was talking about resigning. He's talking about his fucking daughter's life. Maybe actually, you're, I think you're right, Parry, and maybe just saying, of course we're going to keep your daughter alive would, would be a better starting yes. point. <laughs> slightly less dramatic, obviously, but uh, yeah. slightly more pastoral. <laughs> just a little bit, yes. Cheers, sir. Thank you. So then, in two weeks' time, We'll be recording on Thursday, the 6th of October, and covering Memento Mori. That's something to do with memory, isn't it? Uh, AKA Gorn of the Wind. Oh, um, nice. Okay, we'll catch you then. Cheery bye. Bye bye. This time. The opening music for this podcast was provided by the talented Drew Barkas. The artwork was created by Andy Pelastides. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. Find our website at broadcast.libsyn.com And we have a YouTube channel as well. You can find the broadcast playouts on Spotify for your listening pleasure. Visit our Tumblr site at broadcast.tumblr.com where you'll find images accompanying the episodes discussed in this cast. Send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com Or you can contact us via Twitter on rev underscore org or broadcast ammo. Hashtag broadcast.